Hello everybody online and uh, welcome to this spray booth maintenance PPE and booth protection webinar. Um, we're going to be covering various topics throughout the uh, hour that we have. Uh, we are joined today by um, a guest speaker from AGM, Wesley Young, and uh, I'll be passing Wesley over in a second. But just a couple of introductions to start off with. Uh, my name is Steve Hollowell. I'm a UK application specialist for uh, the automotive aftermarket and uh, we're looking at uh, obviously the training, uh, product evaluation and product introductions into the UK and uh, booth coatings and uh, protection equipment etc is part of my portfolio so I'll be touching on those uh, briefly in a second. So I'll just pass you over to Wesley and uh, Wesley can introduce, uh, introduce himself. Good afternoon everybody, my name is Wesley Young, I'm the Sales Director for AGM Services. I've uh, nearly two decades experience uh, with spray booth ovens, initially with Junior spray booths and for the last 10 years with AGM Services specialising in service and maintenance as well as uh, legislative testing and training. Thank you Wes, my name is George Elliott and I work for the Personal Safety Division at 3M. Uh, we in the personal safety division manufacture a range of personal protective equipment. Uh, this is respiratory protective equipment, um, hearing protection, fall protection, body protection in terms of coveralls. Um, and on a day-to-day -day, uh, role, I go out a lot with our sales team, so I'll support the customers, making sure they know exactly what products they need for their requirements to make sure they can control hazards. Um, so my areas of expertise are protective eyewear, protective coveralls and the head and face portfolio. I'm, I'm also fit to fit accredited for face fit testing. We've got uh, an agenda that, we're, we're gonna, that I'm gonna run through now. This is the agenda for, for today. Uh, we're gonna be going back between myself, Steve and Wes as we go through the webinar. But the five areas that we're gonna focus on are duties and responsibilities for the employer, but also employees. Uh, then looking at the potential risks uh, and hazards within the workplace and then the controls that can be put into place. Uh, we're then we're going to be looking at booth maintenance, so looking at efficiency and, and energy savings, uh, and then also booth care and housekeeping. These areas are going to be covered by, by Wes uh, and Steve. And then finally, I will be talking about uh, health and safety side of things, so making sure that you've got the right PPE where necessary uh, and all the, uh, all the aspects surrounding that. So without further ado, I will talk about the duties and responsibilities of the employer. So when it comes to body shops and, and, and spray booths, like any industrial working environment, they're going to be multiple hazards. So this could come from, from dust, from uh, grinding activities, from cutting activities. It could be gas and vapors in, in the spray booth from, from, from paints and, and adhesives and, and sealants. Uh, and then all, all, all could also be uh, noise hazards from machinery which, is being, which are being used. So whenever there are hazards or, or risks within the workplace, under the Health and Safety at Work Act, employers must, so as far as reasonably practicable, ensure the health, safety and welfare at work of their employees. And I've got there on the slide and others because that extends to anyone who may be visiting the site. So this could be contractors, this could be customers, uh, this could be visitors. So it's not just the employees, it's anyone visiting the site. So as a starting point, when there are hazards on site, a risk assessment must, must be conducted to identify the specific hazards and risks uh, and from here appropriate control measures can then be put into place and considered. Uh, now we're going to put on screen quite a few resources which we want to share with you. Um, now don't worry about scribbling them down and writing them down. Uh, a follow-up email straight after this, this webinar will contain all of the resources we're talking about today. But the one I want to particularly pay attention to when it comes, to, it comes to risk assessments is the one on screen here, which is produced from the Health and Safety Executive. So really, really good resource. Uh, it's an example risk assessment which could be utilized uh, by yourselves to make sure that you, you're, on the wrong, you're, you're along the right lines to controlling any risks and hazards within the workplace. Uh, now, Staff also need to be need, need to be trained on, on uh, how to use equipment properly and also the PPE that they're given. And talking of employees, they've also got responsibilities themselves. So legislation requires that employees need to take reasonable care of their own safety and also others around them. And they also need to cooperate with their employer to make sure that any legal obligations need to be met. And this comes down to health, health surveillance uh, and, and other things surrounding that. 
Employee, employees must also make sure that if there's any issues with, with maintenance equipment or PPE that any defects are reported straight away. Uh, and again, there's some really, really good resources about responsibilities for employers and employees uh, via the Health and Safety Executive uh, Motor Body Vehicle Repair um, sites. Again, that's, that uh, link is there and will be sent to you following this webinar. So after a risk assessment has been uh, conducted and the control measures uh, need to be then considered to, to reduce the risks. So preventative control measures should be considered in order of priority and this is often termed the hierarchy controls. So risks and hazards should be reduced to the lowest reasonably, reasonably practicable levels. So in the first instance you need to consider elimination. Now, elimination should always be sought in the first instance, but we know in industrial settings, when specific activities need to be undertaken, elimination is not always going to be possible, but it should be the first thing that is considered. Now, if a task can't be eliminated, um, then could parts of the process be substituted or certain hazards be substituted for less hazardous alternatives. So with, with paint spraying, could less hazardous uh, paints be used as opposed to potentially isocyanates? It's a consideration which should be considered uh, before you start to look at other controls. So then moving on to engineering controls and Wes and, and Steve are going to be talking about this, this shortly but uh, classically with, with paint spraying local exhaust ventilation is used within the booth to uh, try and extract as much paint mist as possible. And also with, with noisy activities, no, noisy tasks, noisy equipment, these are often isolated from the rest of the uh, workspace to make sure that people who don't need to be exposed to it are not. And this all also leads on to, to the next hierarchy control, which is administration control. So if staff do not need to be in the vicinity of the work area, you know, if they're not working on the particular activity, then keep them away from there. So administration controls, again, put that barrier between people and the potential hazard. Now, all of these hazards should be considered in this order. Now, in most cases, there'll be a combination. So it could be, as I mentioned, the substitution of a, of a certain hazardous paint for a slightly less hazardous alternative. But there's always going to be a need for local exhaust ventilation and also administration controls. Now, PPE should always be considered as that last line of defense. So uh, to mop up all the residual risks and, and hazards after the other hierarchy controls have been put into place. Now, the next part of the presentation from, from Wes and Steve are going to be looking at engineering controls, so local source ventilation, things like clearance time, uh, and then I will be taking the last part of the session, which will be talking about personal protective equipment. So I will now pass over to Wes. Thank you, George. So, duties and responsibilities with LEV systems and booth maintenance, uh, some responsibilities for the employers. Uh, spray booth ovens uh, need thorough examination and testing um, through COSH regulations. Uh, COSH states that uh, LEV systems should be tested at periods not to exceed 14 months. Uh, typically, these tests are done annually to allow a period afterwards for any remedial or rectification work found at time of testing. Um, to body shops, um, LEV systems, the most common forms are your spray booth ovens, but there's also dust extraction systems paint mixing rooms uh, and in some instances well fume extraction, exhaust extraction all needs appropriate control. Uh, legally the testing needs to be carried out by a competent person uh, who has a combination of knowledge, skills uh, and application experience uh, as well as experience within their role uh, looking for qualifications uh, through the BOHS such as uh, P601. Uh, these tests that are conducted, they should be uh, recorded, certification, certification should be provided. Uh, that needs to be kept uh, for a minimum of five years. Um, there are a couple of links that you can uh, follow up on uh, on the HSE's website that are listed. So preventative maintenance on spray booth ovens. Uh, spray booth ovens should have a full service uh, at intervals, um, approximately around 750, between 750 and 1,000 running hours. Uh, a full service by uh, 
uh, a skilled team of engineers would include changing ceiling filters or input filters, as well as any pre-filters and, and floor extract filters. Uh, the air handling plant should be serviced at that point, checking uh, input and extract bands, volume control dampers, the burner should be serviced, uh, that has to be serviced by uh, a gas safe registered engineer, uh, and at the same time carrying out general airflow and performance checks. Uh, preventative maintenance reduces the potential for equipment breakdown in between services, so it's a very important that, uh, that this maintenance is kept on top of. Uh, a well-maintained spray booth will increase the lifespan of the equipment, will ensure that productively it's running uh, at its most efficient, and a well-maintained spray booth will keep the running cost of the spray booth down as well. Mixed clearance or smoke clearance testing, as it's uh, sometimes known, uh, is also required. This uh, is an annual requirement, usually taken care of by the same company within uh, the thorough examination and test. Uh, the smoke is replicating uh, the fine paint mist that uh, the eye can't see, uh, measuring the, the clearance time of the overspray within the cabin. Uh, this uh, this test is telling uh, anybody. Uh, who isn't wearing uh, respiratory equipment, uh, the amount of time that needs to elapse before they can enter safely without breathing in any, uh, any particles. The best time for the test to be taken uh, is in its worst case, uh, uh, in a worst case scenario, so when the booth is in its worst condition, which will typically be right before uh, a full service. It's not a performance related test, it's a safety measure. So uh, a quick performing spray booth isn't uh, isn't the main aim here. It's to accurately record uh, when it's safe to enter a spray booth. Again, these results should be recorded and kept for five years. Um, the HSE may uh, visit your site and ask for for those records, so they should be readily at hand. Uh, and as well as that, missed clearance stickers should be displayed uh, clearly on uh, any entrance point to the spray booth. So the main vehicle entrance point but also uh, any personnel entrance points that uh, might be uh, the size of the back of the spray booth. Breathing air quality test is something else that has uh, been introduced uh, uh, test uh, uh, to, to ensure that uh, painters are breathing uh, safe air. Uh, these tests need to be carried out at three monthly intervals uh, these uh, these tests are, are measuring uh, the quality of air that's coming through the filter regulator, checking for substances such as carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, water vapor, oil mist. Uh, if uh, if tests are found to be uh, 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 if if tests fail, then uh, cause of that could be changing filters within the regulators, or there could be an issue going back to the compressor. Uh, not working properly or not having been serviced, so uh, this air is uh, is 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 very important that your painters are breathing clean air. So it's important that these tests are carried out regularly and that uh, compressor servicing is kept on top of. As well as having a contractor in for regular maintenance of spray booths, uh, in-house maintenance uh, is extremely important. Body shops should have uh, their own plan for daily, weekly, monthly checks um, that should be carried out to ensure the spray booth is in, in its uh, uh, best performing condition. Regular extract filter changes should be carried out to ensure that uh, overspray is removed from the spray booth efficiently. The frequency of uh, extract filter change will depend on the size uh, or type of spray booth uh, and the type of extraction, whether that be rear wall extraction, central pit extraction, or, or full floor extraction. Um, but it's important that uh, the body shops uh, and the painters know how often uh, these filters should be changed to make sure that uh, overspray isn't hanging around in the cabin any longer than it needs to be. Um, block spray booth filters affect the performance uh, and will compromise the cleanliness of paintwork uh, and can also affect the safety of people working within the spray booth. 
the key is to have a plan and a schedule in place and not to wait for um, issues to arise with the pressure within the cabin. Other checks that body shots can carry out um, are the, the pressure on the control panel of the spray booth, make sure it's balancing negatively. Um, if the spray booth is in positive pressure, um, it might not just be the filters that are blocked, there could be an issue with uh, the fan units or the dampers. So checking uh, on a daily basis that the booth is running under negative pressure, also that the seals are in, intact uh, and that generally the booth is in, in good working condition on a, on a regular basis. Um, the consumable costs uh, are preventative maintenance, repairing and replacing parts uh, will always be far lower than the cost uh, of a breakdown repair and a loss of production. So um, having internal in-house maintenance checks are extremely important. Okay. Uh, based on all of the things you've just heard, uh, and we know that you guys have invested heavily in the equipment, i.e. the spray booth and also the maintenance contracts and servicing of your booths, uh, but the thing that we need to keep in consideration for most of this is the um, protection of the inside of the spray booths, which we do know that um, people used several different versions of either a booth coating or in some cases film which is stuck to the size of the walls. Uh, if you look at these two views we've got on view at the moment, the one on the left, the picture on the left is where somebody's been using some uh, clear masking film uh, and you know during the course of use then overspray um, basically covers most of the lighting within the booth. And I think as painters we all know that a poor lit booth gives us issues around opacity when we're spraying and we need alternative uh, offerings to be able to see those when we're actually getting the, a, a, a painted job done. So we need to make sure we can keep this as clean as possible. We, we know that there are several products available to us in the marketplace and these can be a liquid applied product. Um, we, that is 3M, supply a non-tacky version of a liquid applied product, uh, but we do know there are sticky versions out there which, when used, are very nice when they're fresh, but entrance doors tend to get very covered in dust and uh, cloudy and tend to start to look very tacky after a period of while. So we offer a non-tacky version. Uh, which is washable just like the others that are available in the marketplace and uh, for fast removal and application this is probably the most um, economical way to protect your booth after it's been serviced and obviously when you've purchased it from new. Alternatively uh, there are several options in the marketplace this being one of the 3M versions which is the dirt uh, dust control systems which uh, we've had around for probably six to seven years now. Uh, it's a non-woven self-adhesive uh, booth coating which basically is applied manually to the booth walls, a bit like um, wallpapering. And the, the system itself is full of uh, lint-free um, levels of collecting of dust. So if you're familiar with microfiber wipes then this works in a very similar fashion in that it traps the dust within the fibers of the material and don't allow that then to fall back into the painted surfaces after they're painted. It's a non-woven construction and as you can see in the image there the, it comes with a, uh, an applicator which is basically a wall mounted magnetic system. There is also a mobile system which we can use in other options. The dust itself um, moves within the loops of the, the booth, but what it will do is it will improve your cycle times. Now, we do know that this is very time consuming to apply, uh, but the removal time is a lot less. So unlike your liquid applied coatings, your liquid applied coatings are pretty quick to put on, but then you've got to wash them and dry the booth off. So in terms of time, um, yes, booth coating liquids are slightly quicker, but the investment in time you get from using this type of material 
pays pays a vid, uh, dividends if you've got a booth that's slightly older, uh, where you can actually brighten the booth up quite nicely, uh, which you can see in these images here. So yes, it's nice to have a 100% white booth wall, and if you've got a brand new booth, then that's great, and it's an asset that you need to protect. So this makes that booth a lot better uh, going forward. If you've got a booth that's maybe three, four, ten, twelve years old, and uh, you don't want to invest the time in actually ripping all the paint off and repainting, then you can actually brighten the booth up. It's not going to be 100%, but it's going to be 80% better than it was. Uh, should you invest the time in painting your booths, then obviously this is going to help too. Um, with all this, we know that it's going to aid your colour matching. It's not the best to do colour matching in the booth, as we know, uh, but hopefully it's going to win uh, the investment you're going to pay uh, in terms of dust uh, that's going to collect in the booth, in, in, in the booth, and obviously on your painted surface is going to be a lot less than it was. So rework becomes a lot better. As for application, as we've mentioned, there are several options. Here we see the guy using the uh, applicated uh, magnetic system on the wall um, and as you can see from the images below uh, you've got now got a lot cleaner booth than you had before so preservation of your booth is important and I think we'll all agree on that I guess the time taken to do this type of maintenance and do this type of work uh, we do know tends to happen at weekends because people don't have the time during the week to do it um, but and there's always a but with all these. Uh, should your booth break down during the course of the week, then you could be two to three days away from getting that booth back up to serviceable condition, uh, which is obviously an issue for you guys because of the amount of time and uh, money you're losing through the booth not being in a perfect working condition. Okay, so thank you, uh, thank you, Steve and, and Wes. Some really, really good information with regards to uh, engineering controls in, in local exhaust ventilation and, and requirements there, and then also some great information on, on maintenance of, of booths. Now, um, I'm going to be taking over and looking at PP requirements within booths. Uh, the main area that we're going to focus on is the spraying of isocyanates, uh, which is a very, very hot topic for the health and safety executive at present. And there's a lot of campaigns uh, at present looking at making sure that workers uh, are protected as they should be. So isocyanates, which are commonly found in two-pack paints, uh, are the most common cause of occupational asthma in the workplace. And health and safety executive statistics uh, recently revealed that vehicle paint sprayers are approximately 90 times more likely of contracting occupational asthma than the average uh, working population. So real, real big hazard uh, and a lot of precautions which need to be taken uh, to protect workers. So even short exposure can cause harm, which is why there's so many requirements to, to controlling this exposure in, in the first place. So as Wes discussed, engineering control, such as local exhaust ventilation, must be utilized in spray booths. But along with this, the health and safety executive have documented that when spraying isocyanates, that only air-fed supplied air systems uh, should be used. And I'll come to talk about those in a little, little bit more detail as we go on. Now, if you're spraying non-isocyanate containers, Containing paints, uh, always check the material safety data sheet because there'll be information there about what type of respir respiratory protection is needed, um, be that a filtering device or indeed supplied air which is required for isocyanate. So always check uh, and we'll have some information in later slides at the end uh, where you can uh, use 3M as a resource to, to have a look at these material safety data sheets to make sure you've got the right respiratory protective equipment. So, like I, uh, like I spoke about earlier, there's lots of really good resources from the Health and Safety Executive. Um, there's three here which, which I've pulled together. Uh, MR2, which is a COSH essential sheet, which is uh, the snippet there you've, you've, got, you've got on screen. Uh, also, the INDG388 and the HSG276. They roll off the tongue, don't they? So, lots of really good information in there on isocyanate spraying, things like clearance times, which obviously Wes spoke about a little bit earlier, uh, PPE requirements and also information on employee health monitoring, uh, things like urine testing and, and so on. So some really, really good resources and as I said a little bit earlier, uh, these will be sent through to you uh, after the webinar. 
So as mentioned, air-fed supplied air systems are the only form of respiratory protection when spraying isocyanate paints in a booth. Uh, and this accounts for the person who's actually carrying out the activity and if there is ever a need for someone else to be in the booth at the same time. So the devices that I've put on screen here are not suitable as they are all filtering air devices. Um, and the, the need for, for supplied air is the fact that it's breathable quality air which is coming through to the wearer. And this is needed um, because the odour threshold for isocyanates, which is the level at which an individual would be able to smell an isocyanate, is typically higher than the allowed exposure limits. So in other words, if a painter was wearing a filtering device like the ones on screen here and could smell isocyanates, uh, they would probably be already overexposed, which is why there's the need for uh, the supplied air systems. So as Wes mentioned earlier, in terms of the supplied air systems and, and checking it, uh, they're providing breathable quality air to the wearer. Um, so the air comes from a compressor, hopefully you can see my, my mouse on the screen here, uh, goes up to a regulator which just sits on the side of the wearer and then this, uh, the air is then regulated to the correct volume to then be brought through to a visor or face piece here. So we've got two examples here to the left and right showing typical applications within a spray booth. Uh, in addition, supplied air half masks could be utilized with goggles in certain circumstances. Uh, so all wearers should be trained to wear the equipment correctly, know how to look after it, maintain it, and test it every time they use it or before before they, they, they use it during that day. Uh, and as, we, as Wes mentioned earlier, the air supply should be in contaminated and in sufficient quality uh, and, and quantity to protect the user. So as detailed by, by Wes a little bit earlier, paint mist is not going to be instantly removed via the ventilation systems within a booth. Um, and many sprayers, and I'm sure you will have seen it, uh, will lift their visor soon, uh, you know, soon after they've done a, a, a certain section of work to check the quality. Um, and because this paint mist is at times invisible, they're going to be unaware that they're still going to be exposed to isocyanate mist. Um, so this practice can cause significant exposure, uh, and we've got a couple, uh, couple pieces of information as, as we go through which, which detail this in, in, in some more depth. I um, want to draw your attention to a health and safety executive document uh, HSC uh, INDG388. Uh, so this is a recent study which was carried out in, in 2015 which looked at the reduction in protection uh, within spray booth when visors were lifted. Um, very, very good document and good to, to have a read through to look at the reduced protection uh, as soon as people lift their visors. What is probably a little bit more accessible is a YouTube video which was created recently by the Health and Safety Executive. Now, unfortunately, we can't play video within the, the webinar software that we've got, um, but what I've done is I've pulled together a few slides. Uh, so if you want to find this video, we're going to send a link out a little bit later, um, but it's a minute and a half, and what it shows is uh, a wearer uh, of a supplied air system spraying. In this case, this is just water mist, but it does represent uh, the same effect that isocyanates would have, the, 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 the mist produced. Um, and what he's got inside his supplied air system, I'm not sure you can see my mouse at the moment, but I am trying to direct it there. But you can imagine inside his hood, uh, he's got a, a monitor which is detecting all of the mist which can potentially be getting in and around the face and the nose. Uh, and then the exposure is shown on this graph here. So you can see at the moment when he's got his supplied air system uh, in place, and as it should be, the exposure is, is low. In, in effect, it's minimal. He's being provided with that, that clean, uh, clean, breathable quality air through the supply air system, so he's not exposed to the isocyanate mist, or in this case, water, water mist. Now, 15 seconds later, um, the, the wearer then inspects his work. So you can see here he's lifted up the visor and all of a sudden the protection that he was being afforded through the visor and, and, and the air which, which is coming through, he has lost. Okay, and you can see with the graft here, the exposure has spiked up dramatically um, and he, he's breathing in all of this isocyanate mist, which of course he wants to be protected from. Now, a few seconds later, 10 seconds later, the, the wearer goes uh, to carry out some, some further activities, he, he lowers his, his visor thinking he is protected, but actually if you look at the graph, 
despite the wearer putting the uh, visor back down, there's still a period of time um, where the visor is down, but there's residual paint mist um, around his, his, his nose and his mouth. So he's still breathing in the isocyanates, despite him actually having that hood down. And as you can see, it takes a long time uh, for that, that mist to clear from around the nose and the face uh, before exposure jumps down again. You can see the final still that I've got here, again, the final inspection, and you can see that hike in exposure once again. Um, so this is a really, really good video, as I say, only a minute and a half in length, but it just shows what can happen when, when you're lifting your visor. Uh, and I'm sure people have seen this uh, on, on, on any given day, people lifting it up, and it may just be for a couple of seconds at a time, but you can start to see that exposure build up. So over a given, given day, if you're in, in a booth for six to eight hours, you can start to see that exposure building up. So the, the clear line from the health and safety executive from, from the research report and the YouTube video is that visor should be down uh, and in place throughout the whole time that you're in the booth um, until the clearance has completely gone. And uh, Wes spoke about clearance times a little bit, a little bit earlier. Okay, um, there's some other really, really good resources from the Health and Safety Executive um, about paint mixing and gun cleaning. Uh, I won't spend too much time on this because the, the, the information is, is uh, quite extensive within these resources, uh, but in essence, uh, both state that respiratory protective equipment should not be needed if extraction systems are designed correctly and working properly, uh, but just make sure that everything that you've got in place within your workplace um, is as per the Health and Safety Executive's uh, recommendations and approved code of practices. Okay, so we, we focus most of the attention on, on spray booths and, and isocyanates and, and paint spraying, but of course there are going to be multiple other hazards within a body shop environment. So this could be dust from sanding and, and cutting, uh, gas and vapors from, from adhesives and, and sealants and of course paints, um, and like in, in a spray booth, controls need to be taken for these other hazards. Uh, so what we'd always recommend is have a look at the material safety data sheet, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, to have a look at what the hazard actually is, and there'll often be recommendations for uh, protection levels in terms of respirators or, or eyewear protection, whether it's a goggle or a spectacle. Uh, but as I mentioned a little bit earlier, if, if you're ever in doubt, we've got a personal safety helpline. Uh, so this is open Monday to Friday, 9 to 5. So if you've ever got any issues or queries you want to raise to make sure you're um, selecting the, 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 the most suitable and adequate item of PPE, please do use that, that resource there. So the numbers are on screen, but we will send them out to you uh, after this webinar as well. Okay, one thing I, I did just want to spend time on uh, in, in, in my last few slides is a respiratory face fit testing. So if wearers have to wear any tight fitting device, uh, they must be face fit tested to ensure that it can provide an adequate seal between the wearer and the face piece. So the types of products which require face fit testing are anything which are tight fitting. So this is your disposable respirators here, reusable half masks, and then also full face visors, which I know uh, from time to time are used within the spray booth environment as well. So anything which is tight fitting, relying on a seal between the wearer uh, and, and the face piece. And additionally, these products should be worn by users who do not have facial hair around the seal to the face. Uh, again, there's lots of resources from the Health and Safety Executive which, which detail why this is necessary, um, and I will uh, send out some further information on this in, in the follow-up email. So, uh, fit testing, face fit testing is, is, a, is a webinar in itself, uh, and we haven't got enough time to, to, to focus on it today. What I will say is that if you uh, are conducting face fit testing uh, in the stages of, of putting in, in a face fit testing uh, program, what we've got is a few resources which may be of interest. So we've got a webinar which was actually conducted a week ago on face fit testing, which can be watched on demand if you visit the 3M Safety Network site. Uh, so this, this webinar is, is 45 minutes in length and discusses the two main methods of face fit testing. We've also got a short YouTube video, eight minutes in length, which just details one of the methods of face fit testing. Uh, and 
we've got lots of other information on the website. So if face fit testing is something that um, you need to investigate or you just want a refresher of re refresher on, we've got lots of resources which are available to yourself. So types of uh, respiratory protective equipment which do not require face fit testing, in essence it's loose fitting head tops. So we've got two examples here, we've got two loose fitting head tops, okay, uh, and then we've got a uh, powered air system here, so a filtering device, there's filters within, within inside the unit uh, which are taking the contaminated air, filtering it, and a motor is sending this, this this filtered air up through to the head top, which is loose fitting. Doesn't rely on a seal to the face, so it doesn't need to be face fit tested. Now, of course, this is not a supplied air system, so it could not be used with isocyanates. The solution you'd need there is on the right hand side, uh, so this is the supplied air system. Again, works in the same principle, but you're taking breathing qu breathable quality air through a regulator, taking it up through to the head top, uh, and then this is providing. Um, breathable air to the wearer when they're carrying out their activities. So these are the products which do not require face fit testing. So I focus most of my, my, uh, my 10 minutes, 15 minutes on uh, respiratory protective equipment. Um, of course we've got lots of other products in the range but I think respiratory protection is, is one of the most uh, important within, within a um, spray booth environment of course and, and in any body shop uh, but one other thing I wanted to focus on is protective coveralls um, so whilst the overwhelming route of entry in, in body shops is through inhalation of, of airborne mist um, isocyanates in particular can cause dermatitis which is why protecting the skin is very very important so protective coverall use uh, is is more than often required um, and just to, just what one thing I wanted to, to, to bring to to your attention is um, make sure you're using protective coveralls uh, which are, are tested to at least type 5-6. Um, the product I've got here in the middle, so the grey coverall, is not a protective coverall. So this is, this is a reusable uh, cotton material which doesn't provide any um, any protection against hazardous substances, you need to make sure you're using a protective coverall approved to, to five, six as a minimum. Um, so that's a little bit on coveralls and, and as I say, if you've got any further information on any PP issues, uh, please do use the health and safety, uh, the personal safety division uh, resource, uh, the, the helpline. And I will now pass back over to Steve. Okay guys, so hopefully we've covered most of the things that we said we were going to do. So the duties and responsibilities, the risks and controls, the booth maintenance, booth care and housekeeping, and uh, the health and safety. So uh, if there's any questions that you guys would like to raise, then please do so through the uh, system that you have. We do have a couple of questions that have been brought up. One of them is from Andy, and he's asking about uh, can he use a battery-powered air supplied system or non-air supplied system, shall I say, uh, when he's spraying uh, two-pack clear coats? Uh, I'll hand that question over to uh, George, uh, but I think I know the answer to that. But uh, I'll let George answer that one. Thank you, Steve. Um, yeah, so I think uh, it, it's. Made, made clear from, from the health and safety executive that it should only be supplied air systems for isocyanate spraying. Um, so powered air systems, um, which, which is a, a potentially a, a, a battery pack on the back of, of the wearer, and I think I brought it up in, in the final few slides. Let me just, just try and bring these up again. Um, so the, the, the system on, on the left hand side is, is a filtering device, so there's actually filters with inside, there's a battery here on, on the base, it's filtering air, there's a motor inside, so it's drawing the contaminated air, taking it through a filter uh, and then providing filtered air to the wearer. Now this in effect is, is the same as a filtering device of a tight fitting um, disposable respirator, reusable respirator uh, with, with gas and vapour filters and it's it's the, 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 the same as, as, as what I mentioned a little bit earlier, R uh, filtering devices should not be used for isocyanates, it should strictly just be supplied air systems um, which I've got here on the right hand side uh, and again the, the resources that we're going to be sending out 
uh, dictate this. Um, so it's, it's it's there in black and white from from the health and safety executive. So hopefully that has has answered your your question there, Andy. Okay, uh, I think that covers most of the things that we've seen. Um, I would just uh, like to reference the things on screen there where you can contact uh, 3M and uh, the 3M personal safety line and also uh, the slide uh, which is next which is um, AGM. So should you need to contact uh, Wesley or, or the uh, team at AGM then uh, we will send these links out uh, for everybody to sort of follow through. So I'd just like to say thank you for a listening to the three of us. I'd like to say that thank you to uh, Wesley and to George to, for attending and the input that we have. And uh, with that, I will now sign off. Thank you very much. I just have one more question that's just come up. Um, once they tell us what the question is, that'll be great. <laughs> Just bear with me a second. Okay, the question here that we have is what is the effective life of the dust trap product or dirt trap uh, that we have? Um, it's a good question in that and unless we know how often the booth is used, uh, if the booth is only used uh, normally three or four times a day, then to change that would depend very much on where things are placed within the spray booth. Commonly we see people spraying in a corner of a booth where you've got panels that are on panel stands. Uh, so those areas are going to be subjected to quite a lot of overspray in those areas and we will look untidy which you can remove and replace the dirt track quite easily on a weekly basis by using a, a blade and just cutting that area out. Uh, for general use or for normal use then we would say Normal booth, we'd probably look at between six to, to eight weeks to change. Um, some people like to change them more frequently, uh, but we have had uh, the booth uh, dirt trap on the walls for more than 12 months. Uh, it doesn't discolor, uh, so having a booth on and off frequently isn't going to cause a problem. Um, so it just depends on the maintenance and uh, contracts that you may have in place. So eight weeks typically. Um, but anything up to 12 months depending on the usage. I hope that answers that question. And uh, as I say, with that, thanks very much for your attendance. And um, any more questions, please send them through to the website address and uh, we'll get back to you uh, with answers as soon as possible. Uh, and uh, as I say, the links and uh, contact addresses will come through straight after this webinar. Well, thanks again. Thank you, everybody, and take care.